It's great to welcome to the program today Michael Kinch, who is Associate Vice Chancellor at Washington University in St. Louis and also author of Between Hope and Fear, which is a history of vaccines. Uh, It's so great to have you on today. Thanks for the opportunity. So we could start in so many different places, but let's let's maybe start with something that's a, a big topic of discussion right now. Um, we've seen sort of a different numbers stated about what the goal should be in terms of the percentage of, of Americans or, or of global citizens. But maybe we'll start with Americans that uh, need to be vaccinated in order for the U.S. to approximate what would be called herd immunity. And of course, there's a number of input factors that determine what this number should be, how contagious um, something is. Uh, how effective the vaccines are and all of these other things. What's what are the sort of the most important things we should be thinking about now in terms of the variants, in terms of vaccine hesitancy, all of these different input factors for if there is this this one number that we should be looking at as as the sort of threshold? Yes. And herd immunity is a term that has actually been misidentified and misused, particularly by the previous administration. And in a nutshell, it's the likelihood that if you're someone who is susceptible, let's say you were a cancer patient who had chemotherapy that knocked down your immune system, what is the likelihood that you will encounter someone um, in your vicinity that might infect you? And that number for SARS-CoV-2, the current source of the pandemic, has been creeping upwards. It started at about 70%, and it looks like today it's probably between 80 and 85% in part because these new variants, the British variant and the South African variant, not to mention the Brazilian variant that hasn't gotten as much press, are far more communicative. So I think we need to be shooting for 85%. And from a realistic standpoint, that means that we need to have probably 90 to 95% of the population protected. Because again, some people will have had cancer therapy, uh, rheumatoid arthritis treatment, they're simply old, very old or very young, and they may be immunized, but the immunization may not take. And so we're gonna have to go in excess of that 80 to 85% number in order to assure that we finally get this virus behind us. Now, this this may be a, a, a silly question, but I've not heard it addressed head on necessarily. When we talk about these numbers, I presume we're talking about the entire population. If you are not including people below a certain age, at least initially, don't we really need 100 percent of eligible adults because there are so many people under 18 or 16, which are the ages that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines respectively have been tested on? Don't we really need every adult vaccinated? We do. And um, essentially, again, that 85 percent number alone means that we need that. The vaccines are being tested in pediatric populations, but we don't have the data yet. Right. And so every adult, in order to protect your children and your grandchildren, really needs to be vaccinated soon. And as you mentioned, it's not just here in the U.S., it's around the world, because when you look at it, um, as we've seen, we have variants coming out of South Africa um, and other countries. And that means that someone in one country or a population in one country that decides not to be vaccinated could actually jeopardize the rest of the planet. On uh, on today's program, one of the things we looked at was uh, a new study that looked at the current level of vaccine hesitancy in the American population. The, the good top line news is that the 60, 65 percent hesitancy of May 2020 has been reduced dramatically. It's that now down, according to this latest study, uh, about a third of the country. When you slice and dice different groups, three groups that are particularly or disproportionately vaccine hesitant when it comes to this uh, uh, vaccination are uh, among political lines, Republicans, among racial lines, black Americans, and among educational lines, uh, those without a college degree for different reasons. Uh, These three groups seem to be hesitant of the vaccine for different reasons. What historically have been some of the most effective ways to get more buy in to mass vaccination campaigns? I think there are two things. One is that we need to be 100% transparent both in what we know and what we don't know. We're not here to sell a used car, we're here to get past the pandemic. And so I think that we need to convey when there is information that we don't know about, we need to convey that, but we also need to convey what we do know and we need to stop rumors. Um, There have been rumors that are completely unsubstantiated about causing lack of female fertility or lack of male fertility and many other things. 
But we also need to respect that there are certain populations of people, for example, uh, Black Americans, that were subjected, for example, to the Tuskegee experiments. Right. And that means that they're hesitant about many different uh, standardized medical procedures. And we need to then explain to them, here is what we know about it and why you're not being an experimental subject, that this is important. And that gets to the second thing we can do to minimize the anti-vax movement. And that is to people, it's been shown, will be more amenable to being vaccinated if someone that they knew was vaccinated mm. and if it went well. And so the more that we get into those populations, the better it should turn out. The um, w- one of the uh, concerns I have, and I'm wondering whether you share it, is that there are many articles that, from my perspective, are underselling the benefits of, uh, in particular, the two vaccines that are approved right now. And sometimes you will see maybe not headlines, but like sub headlines that will mm-hmm. say, even when vaccinated, nobody can do anything differently. Everything has to remain the same for a very long time. And when you sometimes get into the details or look at the blogs of immunologists, as an example, you will actually see much more interesting information like, listen, there is going to be some risk no matter what, uh, but a small group of vaccinated adults 10 days past dose number two uh, is at very low risk to do an indoor gathering, in particular, if everybody works from home, you know, but more more sort of like meat on the bone about there really are some differences. And this is a game changer and it will be more of one as more people get vaccinated. Do you think my concern is is warranted about the underselling of the vaccines? It is, although, again, we don't want to come across to selling a used car. Right. But I think you look at it, these vaccines are truly miraculous. The the magnitude of efficacy and, frankly, safety as well is far beyond what any of us thought a year ago we would be able to achieve, especially within this time frame. And I would say it's better than the Apollo mission. That being said, we are underselling it. And I think that the proper way to address this, what you just mentioned, which is very valid, is to say, look, we don't yet know after you're vaccinated whether you might be able to communicate virus to others and we want to communicate to people the last thing that you want to do is to unintentionally infect your grandparents your children your grandchildren sure and so just to be safe let's keep up those safety measures until we have established herd immunity and let's be clear what herd immunity really means and i think most reasonable people will say, oh, if I'm protecting my neighbors by doing this, that that's a great reason to do it. Not that it's this onerous thing that we have to continue to do. You were talking about the Republican pushback to vaccination. This is simply a continuation of the denial that the pandemic was real, the denial that the masks effect, are effective. And we have to get past that and say, look, independent of what your political views are, here's what the science tells us. What uh, is the best way for someone to um, accurately sort of parse as you talk about so many rumors every single day? There's something the Moderna vaccine doesn't work against the South African variant. Oh, it does. But it just is more borderline in terms of the immunity versus being more robust against the UK variant. And oh, well, maybe that's not true. Uh, We need to get to one level of herd immunity versus another. And then the next day we find out, oh, the number is actually different for for the average person, particularly people not like me who do this for a living, but people who have other jobs where where they can't follow this stuff necessarily that that closely. What's the best way to stay up on what the sort of top line realities are about cases, about deaths, about vaccination, treatment, et cetera? Well, now that the Centers for Disease Control uh, and Prevention is under capable hands again, I think that you can go back to trusting them. Frankly, this we had the best um, public health group on the planet until the, the this pandemic broke out and they lost a lot of their credibility. And I frankly was telling people, don't listen to CDC because they weren't giving the right information. But I would say if you had one go-to reliable place, it would be the CDC. Otherwise, don't Google. Um, go, for example, to Mayo Clinic or go to whatever your local hospital has to say. Look what they have to say. Um, Google and Twitter. I mean, one of the amazing things is that if you look at the anti-vax movement, not just for this pandemic, but MMR and other vaccines, it is discomforting to know that about 85 to 90 percent of the tweets that are anti-vax are coming from Russian troll farms. Mm. And all they are doing is really undermining, and their intent is to undermine belief in authorities. And so I have 
not naive belief in authorities, but especially the CDC, it's turned itself around just in the past few weeks, still got a lot of room to make up, but go to the major universities, other places that are not making money or profiting in any way from this. For the most part, the pharma companies have actually been surprisingly transparent. There have been some exceptions, and I've been a big critic of the exceptions, and we need to be critics of the exceptions. And But I would say that, that most people so far have come together and been mostly responsible. When it comes to vaccines per day, when Joe Biden was just days from being sworn in, he was talking about a million a day for 100 days. Of course, at the time, the approved vaccines are, are two doses, meaning you're talking about vaccinating 50 million people. We're now hopefully getting closer to the approval of the J&J vaccine, which will be a one dose. And then there's potentially more more vaccines coming um, when when you're looking at this. I mean, it's it seems to me that with a third vaccine two and a half to three million doses a day total is is reasonable, which seems like it would be a major accomplishment. But we're still talking about months there in the best of cases until everybody can get vaccinated. What sort of numbers are you looking at? I mean, I think the the, the two key numbers to remember are 350 million Americans. Right. Which if we forget the J&J vaccine for a minute. That means 700 million doses, which is a lot. And this is a brand new technology. But then the other number is seven and a half billion humans, which then means 15 billion doses. And again, this isn't over until it's completely over. Now, I believe and hope that the J&J vaccine is likely to be approved based on on what we've seen. Right. Um, Its efficacy numbers are, again, very impressive. They're not quite up to the mRNA vaccine numbers, but at least it could get someone some transient protection, if you will. And, and future studies can determine, well, maybe someone who got one vaccine will need a boost of another. But I, the, the most remarkable thing about the vaccine numbers is not necessarily just the magnitude of efficacy, which is exceeding at this point 95%. And based on the Israeli study, it may be closer to 99.5%. Right. But it's the fact that the disease severity is greatly reduced and people, frankly, are not dying or getting severe disease. And that's where we want to be. If you're stuck with feeling bad for a few days or getting a cold, which most coronaviruses cause a cold, that's infinitely better than having to be intubated and, and Lord forbid, pass away or have your relatives do so. So I would say the big numbers now are we've got to ramp up production. The need now, the concern now is not anti-vax. The concern is manufacturing and making sure that the manufacturing quality still stays high. And that's where, again, FDA has been very consistent and fantastic about doing that. There have been some uh, some uh, preprints based in some cases almost on accidental circumstances that have surfaced, which suggest and again, I want to be careful to, to make clear that we're talking about something we're still learning about, which suggests that in some cases, if at the time that the second dose would be given, you just kept waiting, you would get a very close level of protection to what you get from the second dose plus seven to 14 days. Is that an interesting path that you think needs to be looked at in terms of of possibly being able to expand the number of people inoculated with the vaccines we're expecting to have? If the data show it, um, I think that we, we run a risk. There was a there was discussion about giving everybody one shot. Right. And even if it falls outside the window uh, that was done in the clinical trials, um, giving them a later shot. We just frankly don't have the data to say whether that's useful or not. And the, the situation we don't want to end up in is that we give everyone one shot and one shot turns out to be insufficient and we have to start and turn around and, and begin afresh. Right. So now everyone needs to get two shots, even if you already had one. And we just don't, that we have to be guided by the data. Um, we The last administration was frustrating because they didn't seem to want to track any data. Um, and this administration, I think, is open to it, but there's going to be pressure to hit these artificial numbers. I would say 100 million in 100 days is great. All I care about is as many as can be safely done. That's the number we need to get. And hopefully that'll be well in excess of 100 million. No doubt about it. Yeah. And two million last Saturday and two million last Sunday certainly are, are great, uh, great, great numbers to start seeing. Uh, we've Absolutely. been speaking with Michael Kinch, author of Between Hope and Fear, A History of Vaccines, also associate vice chancellor at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, such a pleasure having you on. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much.